All right, uh, thanks guys for coming. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the deep learning um, discussion, as we mentioned. Uh, basically, I'm going to go over the uh, kind of the fundamentals of uh, neural networks, deep learning, machine learning, um, and talk about uh, basically CAFE, it's, it's how it's structured, um, and then kind of give you guys some tools, some resources to help get started. So, Definitely not going to be comprehensive, it's just going to cover some of the basics. Um, yeah, so uh, first we're going to talk about why we're talking about deep learning um, and uh, why it's got be such a hot topic. Second, we're going to go over some neural network basics. I know several of you uh, have already had this before, uh, but for those of you who haven't, um, I'm just going to go over the fundamentals just because they're necessary to understand how CAFE works. Um, then we're going to go into some details, CAFE, what it is, how, uh, how it's structured, um, and then we're going to try to do a little tutorial at the end, and then uh, give you guys some links and some places to get started. So deep learning is a statistical approach to AI. So traditionally, AI has been focused on uh, reasoning and logic, so that's classical AI where a series of if-then statements, essentially, this happens, do that, if that happens, do this. Um, that sounds good in theory, uh, except it's hard to model complex problems like that. And so um, the innovation was, was uh, created that you basically rely on the data and find the patterns in the data. And so that's where this statistical approach comes in. Basically, by deep learning, they mean that um, a typical neural network is lo larger, both in the number of uh, inputs and therefore the number of parameters that it can, can contain, uh, but it also allows you to understand higher complexity uh, data and model higher complexity than like a typical neural network would. And the real key there is uh, nonlinear functions. Uh, so if you're in machine learning class, you're learning about linear regression and other linear models. Uh, those are fine for simpler data, uh, but they are not suited for uh, understanding more complex data like image data and uh, other things. So um, that's why we turn neural networks to, uh, to solve that. Um, so basically there's an abstract representation of data. It's kind of what I was saying about having a lot of uh, parameters can understand complex data. Uh, and there's no manual feature design, which is a big hindrance in uh, traditional computer vision. Uh, where you've got, say, you've got to design a feature extractor for a human face and then one for um, an outdoor scene. Uh, in, in, in deep learning, there's no need to manually design these feature extractors. Uh, it's what the, the weights of the, um, of the neural network are going to learn on their own automatically. Um, and so it allows you to kind of free yourself from worrying about the, the details of how it's working um, and, just, and just focus on uh, optimizing it. Uh, and there's been huge breakthroughs in, of course, Facial and object recognition and detection. Uh, Facebook is well enough for this with their auto tagging. Uh, speech recognition, uh, everything from Google Now um, and, and other uh, text to speech um, or speech to text uh, services and natural language processing. But huge breakthroughs. Problems that have eluded researchers for 40 years or more um, have in the past few years been like broken uh, or at least uh, solved, close to solved. Due to deep learning techniques, uh, foreign language translation, uh, the list goes on with the uh, applications. So. Uh, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about the neural network basics. Um, next one. Yeah, so uh, essentially, neural networks are just supervised learning technique uh, labels associated with inputs, trying to map inputs to their corresponding labels. Um, and as I said, it's going to be a very brief overview because I know most of you guys already know this. Um, but uh, since you get your inputs, the hidden layers, and your output layers, and each of your neurons uh, is going to fire or activate uh, based on some type of activation function. Uh, and this is where the, the details actually start to get involved. Um, activation functions tend to be focused, and we'll go into this a little bit more, but tend to be focused on uh, forcing the data to, to uh, a, a discrete value or another discrete value. Um, kind of the analogy in the human brain is that synapse fires uh, or it doesn't, and so you need a certain amount of, of uh, 
certain threshold of energy essentially to fire that neuron. And so you try to mimic that with certain types of mathematical functions. Um, so outputs, uh, they uh, evaluate based on your loss that you define. There's, and we'll go into some details of the loss functions, but um, you can find your own. There's a lot of common ones, uh, but essentially it's all about measuring the difference between the expected output of the network and the actual output of the network and trying to minimize that. Um, and that's what the next step is about, about propagating errors backward. Uh, you're adjusting the weights of the network in the back, through the uh, back propagation algorithm. And uh, this is done through derivatives of the errors. And, uh, and essentially the process is repeated. Uh, another forward pass to the network, uh, another error calculation, and another back, back propagation. Um, and the process repeats. I included a uh, course website down here from Stanford's um, I think it's a machine learning course. Uh, it's a really good website to check out. Uh, there's a link down here. It's CS231 in. The uh, they have a lot of good, very basic for someone getting seriously involved in machine learning, but not so basic that it's not useful. Um, so I really highly recommend that site uh, for just understanding um, a lot of the nuanced details about activation functions, about different types of layers, about different loss functions, how they work, um, and the general process of things like gradient descent and, and things like that. So that's uh, a good resource. Uh, next one. So basic, uh, simplest case of a, of a uh, neural network is just a perceptron, uh, which is exhibited over here on the right. Basically, you have three inputs, x1, x2, and x3, uh, and they are combined, <clears throat> some type of summation combined uh, in this uh, center activation function in the middle. And uh, each one of those inputs corresponds to a weight. Those weights are then uh, multiplied, essentially, uh, times, the, times the respective input. Um, and then, depending on the result of the activation function, uh, y will be your result, will be your predicted result. And uh, that's going to be belong to one class or another. <clears throat> and so, essentially, you can have, in this case, you've got a three by one vector representing your inputs. You've got a, a uh, unknown, which is your one by three. And if you use simple uh, matrices math here, you, you realize that there's gonna be a, a one by one scalar output for, for this particular uh, network. And as you see on the right, it's the, the uh, weight, weight vector at, uh, w times the x vector going to give you the scalar output y. So that's kind of the basics of um, kind of how the, the uh, math works for the, for the network. Um, so the problem with this is that it's not very useful. Uh, we don't need a neural network to understand uh, or to, to solve for w. Uh, we can use algebra to do that. If you go to the next slide, I'm talking about that. So, so the previous example was a linear uh, Classifier. Essentially, you got just a linear combination of weights and values. Um, so, as I mentioned, it's kind of trivial, and it's no, no need for a neural network. So, we do need neural networks for um, uh, non-trivial problems. That is, non-linear problems. So, problems that can't be easily modeled, like the one on the left here, where you can easily draw a line between two forms of data: the, the blue data on the left, on the right, and the left uh, red data. So oftentimes in real problems, you get what you see on the right, which is uh, noisy data that is not easily classifiable. Um, and so you need a more sophisticated classifier that is a nonlinear classifier. Um, and, and generally the way it works here, as you can see on the one on the right, is your features are generally plotted. This is a simple one. You've got two features, a feature one and feature two. But it's, it's very common to have um, lots of features, hundreds, thousands of features. Um, and there's a lot of techniques uh, and whole fields of study aimed at reducing this, those number of parameters and um, sort of extracting just the most relevant ones also. So here's three examples of nonlinear activation functions. These are, again, what the, um, these are how the inputs are being combined. Um, and that, if you think back to that, uh, that first neural network uh, schematic I drew, uh, so one example is a sigmoid, which is given by 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. Um, and, and this is what it looks like plotted, where you've got, on the far left, you've got it going from negative infinity, it's at 0, approaching 0. 
and at one it's it's approaching infinity. And so what this has done is essentially for the majority of values that are input into this network, most of them will be approximately one or approximately zero, with very few uh, lying in between. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of on the left it's not firing, it's a zero, and on the right that neuron is firing to the right. So you've got a similar function over here with tangent, uh, or hyperbolic tangent, where essentially you've got instead of between zero and one, you've got between negative one and one. Um, and it doesn't really matter, you just basically uh, normalize your data to this range. Um, so uh, the, the difference, the range difference doesn't matter as much as the shape of the function. The fact that, again, on the left, you've got um, the, the neuron would not be firing for, for x's, for large values of negative x, and then for uh, positive x, uh, it's approaching 1, so the, the activation function would be firing. Um, and then you've got one here, uh, commonly known as RELU, or rectifier linear unit. Uh, you don't really know if you can tell, but down here on the left, uh, there's a, that's a horizontal line along the, uh, along the uh, negative x-axis there. And essentially what this is, is, is if you think about it, if the, if the input is negative, then it makes it zero. So it sort of uh, baselines it at zero. And then if it's positive, then it's, it just returns that positive value. Um, and so a more useful function, as opposed to the one that we saw earlier where it was y equals wx, this is a more likely uh, a problem that you see in, in a real machine learning problem where you've got two weight matrices, uh, W1 and W2, and essentially you're solving for both of these weights um, by, uh, by and through, through the training process. So your, again, your X's are your inputs to the network, and your W's are an unknown, uh, in this case, two matrices, um, which are, are the, the weights of the network that are being tuned and updated. Um, so you're learning those weights, and, uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, stochastic gradient descent is the most common approach for optimizing these networks. So these are just three uh, um, activation functions that are very common. These are not the only ones. There's absolute value, there's power, um, and, and I'm sure there's others. Uh, but essentially you need a nonlinear function um, in order to model non-trivial, non-linear data, essentially. So you go next. Uh, so just a brief thing about convolutional neural networks. Um, I'm not going to go into really much detail here because uh, it's kind of its whole, whole own topic. But it's important for CAFE because that's really the bread and butter of CAFE is, um, is, is image data and convolutional neural networks are pretty um, essential and become a central part of, of learning uh, image data. And so essentially what you're doing is it's a feature extraction technique, again, an automated feature extraction technique, um, where you've got a kernel, a little, little window essentially, uh, with, with values that are that slid across the image, uh, convolving the subregions underlying. The, a, a convolutional layer, as they're called, uh, is generally followed by a max pooling layer, which is Basically, uh, from each one of those subregions, you're taking the maximum value out of that subregion, and you're um, gathering those together. Now, the intuition, and basically, you're you're you're, um, you're throwing away the rest of the data. So it, it seems counterintuitive to throw away important data in an image, but in reality, what we want is a model not trained on this specific image, but images like this. So if we if we design a model that is only looking for Every, that is looking for every single pixel and every single feature in this particular image, it's not going to generalize well to all images. So the, concept, the intuition behind max pooling is that you're going to take the most relevant bits of information from different regions in the, uh, in the input image and then uh, take those and then pass it on to the next layer of the network. So convolution and pooling are generally go hand in hand in most practical uh, networks. This is also a good, this is a good interactive demo here at this website. Uh, you can scroll your mouse over the image, um, see how the weights are updated, uh, drag it, see how the image looks after it's been uh, convolved with the filter, and uh, pretty, pretty neat little, uh, little website, so it's a good one to check out. Okay, so kind of getting involved, so we've got, we talked about kind of the theoretical part behind everything, 
uh, I want to give you some actual, um, something to take away today so that uh, you don't feel like you just rehash everything you already know. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next part about uh, introducing CAFE um, and we'll talk about what it is and what it's good for and, and how it can make your, uh, your research and your life a lot easier um, uh, in terms of like achieving, treating state-of-the-art results. So. So it was originally developed at Berkeley uh, just a couple of years ago, so it's fairly new. Uh, it was kind of the first commercial grade uh, deep learning system. Uh, there were others before it, uh, but it, uh, it had a lot of innovations that have, have really panned out well for it in terms of adoption. Um, state of the art, uh, just about every state of the art model out there is supported by CAFE. Um, that really depends on the open source community because it is an open source project. So um, sometimes something new will come out, it takes a little bit, there's a little bit of delay to implement it, get it you know, uh, integrated into the, the main branch. But, um, but, but in general, most models are out there. Probably most models that we'll be working on uh, uh, are supported in CAFE right now. Um, there are some other, I don't know if you call them competitors, but other um, platforms out there. Most notably, um, uh, Torch is popular with uh, Facebook, and uh, I think mean, Google's DeepMind is that. Um, TensorFlow is what Google Brain developed in-house, and it's open source, and it's gotten a lot of support here recently. Um, but in general, all the networks, while their syntax is different and their libraries are different, the, the kind of structure is the same. Um, so it's not start learning one, it's not like, um, you know, I'm stuck with this one. Um, it's not that much of a leap to transfer to the next. Um, so it's fast. Uh, GPU runs on GPU. Um, got a lot of libraries for, for all the all the layers and functions are implemented in, that, in the GPUs. Um, and so uh, you can process, do a lot more data processing than you used to, you used to be able to. Uh, years before GPUs were popular for, for research. Um, it's flexible, you can uh, essentially, uh, it's a layer-wise architecture, so you essentially define a layer and then string them along together. Um, so if your network is totally unique and nobody else has done something like it, you just add a specific layer, you um, kind of have a little bit of uh, binder in their code, and then essentially you, you can have your own new network that no one's ever done before uh, without too much effort. And I'll talk about some details about that. Uh, and the last thing is in high demand. Uh, I'm applying for a lot of jobs right now. I can't tell you how many are looking for something involving CAFE or similar deep learning framework. Uh, a lot of them are asking for this. So this is not time wasted, putting time and effort into this. So you will get it out what you put in, uh, for sure. So, okay, next one. so this is a question I've got quite a bit. What is CAFE? Uh, it's kind of hard to explain in one sentence, but Essentially, it's a collection of routines uh, capable of modeling deep neural networks and handling structured data. Um, so that's kind of a vague definition. But uh, the idea is that you don't have to implement right everything from scratch. Um, there's a lot of implementations, both in the CPU and GPU implementations, of common types of layers, like the ones we've already talked about, convolutional layers, um, uh, max pooling layers. Uh, but there's a lot of other types that you'll run into in your machine learning research, and most all of those are already implemented on CAFE. So it's essentially you import the layer you need, and then you add it to your network, and you're done. There's no um, uh, there's no uh, you're writing low level uh, routines to, to get it implemented. Um, it's got a lot of those functions that we talked about: tan, uh, type of all tangent, soft uh, uh, sigmoid. And all those functions are already implemented, so you don't have to worry about any of the math uh, in terms of implementing it yourself. Um, there's, there's tools in it for serializing your data, um, which when you're dealing with large-scale deep learning networks, um, sometimes it's not practical to be reading one image in at a time. Uh, a lot of times you'll read an entire, uh, your entire batch in and have that serialized and run that through. It's much quicker. Um, so they so provide tools for doing that. Um, and it's all, it all comes in the, in the CAFE package. When you, you know, uh, get clone from GitHub CAFE, you'll, you'll get all of this. Uh, and then, so it can handle not just images, though. Uh, anybody doing research in, in text-based stuff, so um, kind of more data mining sort of related stuff, uh, numeric stuff, audio, 
uh, basically any data that can be quantized um, and fed into a network as, as discrete unit and inputs um, can CAFE can handle. So it's pretty robust in terms of its capabilities. Um, and then it also allows you to, as I mentioned, define a layer-wise uh, network. So we'll talk about that. So now CAFE is available for all the OSs. I think Microsoft, uh, Microsoft itself has, has uh, ported over um, to, uh, to their system, as well as there's a lot of unofficial uh, versions for Microsoft. Uh, I personally run it on Linux and, um, and, and my Mac. Also, um, basically, the, your your kind of go-to shop for for uh, cafe is this cafe.berkeleyvision.org. Uh, this is where this is the official uh, uh, installation guide is. Uh, there's a lot of dependencies for it. There's um, probably ten or fifteen or something in there, uh, and it does take a while to install. Uh, when I first started, it it was painful, uh, frankly, because I had not worked with a lot of these libraries and um, and hadn't configured you know, uh, other libraries across the Linux system before. So it was definitely a learning process. I have a tutorial on, or a, a little um, kind of how-to on my personal website, which I link to also, which kind of breaks it down for dummies like me who need like a step-by-step -step process. Um, so feel free to check that out and let me know if anything's wrong and I can update it. But, um, you find a lot of tutorials out there will be like, oh, just do this and then do that, and then they don't really cover like the ten steps and the ten those steps that you know not your average like person, even a computer science person would know. Um, so that's what kind of what I struggle with, and so I try to list all those details out. Um, it's also common to have uh, Cafe running on something like AWS. Um, of course, you got to pay for that uh, if you're. If you're using a lot of uh, compute power, uh, but sometimes if you're wanting to set up your own thing at home, if you don't want to spend 1,200 bucks on a GPU, um, this is a good option for uh, you can start it up, start your instance up, run test, and then shut it down and stop paying for it. Um, so that's a that's a nice option for not for this slide because we have GPUs in here, but um, if you're wanting to do it at home, this is a good option. And uh, all these types of installation guides are unofficially hosted at, on GitHub at, at their wiki. Uh, it's kind of piecemeal uh, together. It's not very formal. Um, I think this the, the developers of, of Cafe don't do this full time, and so it's kind of when they can update, they update it. But they're pretty active on the uh, on the Google Groups message board and also on on uh, GitHub itself. So. Generally, if you bring up an issue, you find a bug within like a day or so, somebody will be responding to you, if not immediately. So this little program for success I wrote, uh, based on all my failures at trying to get started, uh, essentially, and and I wrote this in, in, Py in Python, a pseudo Python here, uh, because of a reason I'll get to in a minute. Um, but essentially, this is your pipeline for, for, for using CAFE. Um, in the try block there, you can see that you basically need to implement your network architecture, which uh, we haven't really talked about architecture in general. We talked about layers themselves, um, but not how to design your own architecture. Um, but, but you'll do that first. Uh, you need a loss function, which you've already talked about. Loss is, um, is how the error is generated. And, um, and how the gradients will be propagated backwards. Uh, preparing and loading your data is sometimes annoying, uh, but it's an important part of machine learning and something you should uh, learn to be comfortable with uh, if you're not already. Uh, training your network tends to be the easy part. Uh, you basically just let it do its thing. Uh, all the steps before it are what takes the most time. Um, and then the last step takes a while sometimes too because you got a million bugs and you can't figure out why. Um, and so, what do you do? Well, you got an error. Well, you go to the docs, you try to read them, uh, which I did not do when I first started. Uh, I, I just Googled everything, and I found that a lot of the, uh, my questions were answered if I had read a lot of the documents. So, definitely read the documentation when you get started. Um, it will save you time and all, all that. Uh, search Google, of course. Uh, there is a Google users group. 
that is very active. Um, sometimes it's hard to find your topic because it's just kind of a, a, a flood of data, but you can search it like Google, of course. So um, hopefully you can keyword match what you're looking for. Here go to the next slide. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned a couple times before, layer wise basis probably doesn't mean much to you now, but other other um, network, other frameworks are not all built this way. Uh, I think Torch is like a graphical based model, um, so they're not all the same. Uh, but essentially, data is blobs. It is not. Um, it's not as simple as like, oh, I've got a um, an RGB image, and I'm just going to send that through. Um, it's partly that, but a lot of other things get attached onto it as it goes through the network. Um, so a blob is a multi-dimensional array uh, that includes everything in the network, like um, uh, the, the, the hyperparameters, which are like learning rate, momentum, and those things. Um, it's got um, the gradients associated with it, um, a lot of other things, and all of these are accessible through uh, like fields, so you kind of do your your network blob dot data and to find the name or whatever, so you can access those those fields um, individually. But all of that is contained in blobs. Um, uh, if you're doing images, which a lot of us in here will be doing, uh, the blob is an n by c. I'd say number times channel times height times width. Number being the batch size. Uh, I didn't go over batch size in the uh, machine learning talk, but Essentially, a batch size is uh, how many uh, samples you're loading into memory at a time. Um, and so, for uh, for very deep networks, um, sometimes you can't load a lot of data because there are so many parameters being um, being learned. Um, it can only handle maybe a smaller batch size. And so, if you run up against memory limits, which happens a lot, uh, if you try to have 250 uh, samples and load them all into memory, uh, you're probably going to get a memory error where you even on a 12 gigabyte GPU, uh, which sounds ridiculous, but it's it's happened to me plenty of times. One of the easiest ways to reduce that error um, is to reduce your batch, batch size. So my system right now is a batch size of one, so I'm only loading one image at a time in, into memory uh, to learn. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, this is another gotcha here for a lot of people starting. Uh, it is not RGB, it is BGR, which is because of OpenCV and some something uh, in terms of the implementation. Um, so all of your data needs to be swapped. Uh, so uh, that's that's kind of a uh, kind of annoying thing, but it's you just get used to it basically. Any questions about that before? All right, so we got our first to do, which is define your, your network architecture. Uh, this is done in a prototext file. Now, I had never worked with prototext before, but it is similar to JSON in that it's a structured uh, language, or excuse me, a structured data format. Um, so you've got curly brackets open, you've got fields, close them, um, and that's how you define a layer. And I'll show you some examples of layers uh, defined. Uh, originally developed by Google, now it's pretty widely used. Uh, this is one of the dependencies, which is protobuf. Uh, is, is, excuse me, uh, protobuf file is part of protobuf. Uh, there's a typo here. Um, and uh, so you'll have to install protobuf uh, before before installing Cafe itself. But, uh, so the protobuf files uh, that you'll mostly be working with are train and val, training and validation. Um, you can also create a joint one called train val where Essentially, you have both your training network and your validation network integrated into a single file uh, with just flags to indicating which one's which. Uh, your training uh, prototype file, this is your training network. So what is, what's the difference in a training network and a validation network? Well, not a ton. Uh, mainly, it's the data layer, which is which data are you using. Because in machine learning, um, as you probably know, uh, you have generally data set aside for training purposes only, and then you have data set aside for testing or evaluation purposes only. Um, and so you don't want to mix that data, and therefore the data layers should, should be different. You should have training data pointing to your training data, validation data pointing to your validation. Um, and then the other difference is that in your training uh, architecture, in your loss layer, your very last layer, 
uh, you're not going to be um, you, you're going to be propagating waste, but you're going to be lost in your propagate those waves. Whereas in a validation network, you're not a trained network; you're just validating, so there's no propagation of, of the weight. So the skew of the loss gradients backwards. Um, yeah, so basically you kind of define the layers, the size of each layer, uh, excuse me, the size of the data coming in the layer, the size of it going out. So just because data comes in at one size doesn't mean it has to leave it that size. You can reshape it um, depending on what you need, which layer you need to send it to. Um, and you'll, you'll, you kind of have to slowly learn that depending on what your application is. But uh, hyperparameters, lots of things are defined in these, uh, in these blocks of, of the, the protobuf. Uh, Format. So, um, I recommend finding a network with a, with a Python file, um, and I can show you that when we do like a little tutorial. Um, but basically, you you could theoretically type it all out into this file in, in proto buff format, uh, but it's not very practical. It's error prone. Um, so, just having one file to generate it for you is, is a lot better. So, uh, there's a good example here. This is. Uh, uh, Evan Shellhammer uh, is one of the developers at, at uh, Cafe. I think he's a PhD student from so UC Berkeley. Anyway, I've been following his research, and he's got a lot of good. Um, he's got a lot of good demos and, and example files that you can go kind of uh, borrow his his uh, kind of way he does it, uh, which I've done. So, uh, you go next one. Uh, so. Yeah, so this is a good example of the prototypes files. Um, this one on the left here is a data layer, as you see highlighted. Uh, every layer has a name. Uh, in this case, it's MNIST, which is a handwritten digit uh, data, uh, uh, data set. Uh, there's, there's different types of parameters depending on the, uh, the layer type, like in this case, transform param. Um, you basically point it here to where your data is, the actual source file of your data. In this case, this data has been transformed into an LMDB file um, that is a serialization format. Um, again, you don't have to do that. You can point it to just a directory with uh, JPEGs in it. Um, but this is a common technique to have it point to a, a LMDB or a level DB file. Uh, the back size, as you can see, 64 is defined there. And the top, this is an important point, every, every network, uh, excuse me, every um, layer should have a bottom, which is the inputs into the network, and a top, which would be the outputs out of the network. So the only exception to that is a data layer, which doesn't have inputs. It, it's consider, it considers the data and labels as, as top layers. So this is what's coming out of the data layer. Um, so, but, but you can think of these two as your inputs to your network, your data, and your labels. So you got data coming into the network at one end, um, and, and your labels that are, you're going to check at the end. So the second example here, this is an inner product layer, which is a common uh, neural network operation. Um, this could be uh, convolution, it could be a lot of other layer names, but in this one, this example is the inner product. Um, you're defining this num output, is defining the number of outputs of that layer, uh, not of the network, but of that layer itself. Uh, these weight fillers, there's some other details in here, basically about initializing the network um, with, with, random bear, with random values at first. All that I won't get into now, um, but this is another example. Of, this is kind of like an intermediate layer. This is a layer that's going to be in the middle of the network. And then the last layer, and there's more layers than just these three. These are just, I just grabbed a few out of uh, one of the networks. And the last layer is uh, your loss layer. In this case, it's softmax, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. But, um, and then again, what you'll see here is that this layer is IP2 in the middle, and coming out of IP2 is top. Which, so essentially, um, coming into it is IP1, coming out of it is IP2, um, and then IP2 is fed then into the loss layer. So the output of layer IP2 is the input of layer of loss. Um, so IP2 goes into loss as a bottom, and then essentially labeled down here from the original data layer is then sent to the last layer data, or excuse me, label. And so IP2 is compared to label and then your softmax is calculated, and your top is your loss, so your top comes out. So it's not, visually it's not very easy to follow. Um, there, there is a little tool you can use to generate a graphical model of what the network looks like, um, but this is kind of the concept of, of tops being outputs, bottoms being inputs. Um, 
All right, so defining a loss function is an important part of it. Uh, you can't just grab a random loss function and just assume it's going to work yet. I really think why you're choosing it. Um, so for softmax, which I just uh, showed you, is uh, essentially as you're normalizing the outputs uh, based on the other outputs. So yeah, as I was saying, you got softmax, which is sort of a uh, relative maximum. So it's not, uh, so it's, it's kind of a, uh, the most maximum of your outputs, essentially, is the, the intuition behind it. Uh, you've also got Euclidean loss, which is one of the simplest, which is simply defined as the a distance measure between your input and your output, uh, excuse me, your, your output and your predicted, uh, your expected output, excuse me, your predicted output and your expected output. Um, so that's saying, my network output this, but it should have been that, what's the difference, and you, you essentially calculate a, a a distance formula is all it is. Uh, so practically speaking, this might be the difference in class number. Maybe your class predicted was four, should have been a ten. It's a distance between those. Um, you also have a hinge or max margin loss, uh, which is kind of like what we saw earlier, where you got a max function, where essentially um, this f of x i, this is the output of the network for a given in, for a given sample x i. So depending on the output of the network for that sample, um, you, want it, you want to take the maximum between one minus that and then zero. So what this does is essentially creates a, a hinge uh, type effect where you've got like a ramp look. Um, and that's uh, it's kind of a way uh, that you, you want to essentially, um, a, perf a perfect, uh, perfect network would have a perfect hinge. Uh, more realistically, you kind of have a curved uh, shape essentially is what this what this uh, loss function does. And there's lots of others. Uh, currently I'm writing, Dr. Lou and I are writing uh, two of our own loss functions uh, and implementing them uh, myself. So uh, these are just three examples, do not all of them. It'll really depend on your application. Um, uh, so quick word about uh, Python. I, as I mentioned, I, I wrote that little uh, pseudo program in Python. The reason that I do that is because I recommend everybody using Python. Uh, it's not very hard to learn, um, and it's very, very widely used. So it's not like it's not an obscure language. Um, it's not just for this. You can use it in web development and all sorts of other things. Um, object oriented, doesn't matter. Uh, so it's a good language to learn. Uh, the reason I say to learn it uh, for this is that originally Python, excuse me, Cafe. Uh, it was all written in C++, and in order to customize it really for your own needs, you had to implement a lot of files. Um, generally five or six files, you had to uh, you know, recompile it, update it, do all these other things, um, and it was just kind of a hassle. And if you didn't have uh, strong skills in, um, you know, could, uh, you know, NVIDIA library GPU implementations, um, if you didn't really do a lot with memory access and other low-level functions, it was very difficult to implement your own version, um, or at least not trivial. Um, so a Python wrapper was developed uh, not that long ago that essentially exposed the internal workings of, of CAFE through simple functions. And what it allows you to do is, instead of implementing all these functions, you can simply create it in Python class, implement a few functions in that class, and then uh, you use that directly into your network. So there's no recompiling, there's no, um, there's no low level act memory access. So in my case, I'm defining two new loss function classes. Um, it's, it's a formula that we came up with. Uh, I've coded that formula out and put it in this Python layer and then um, put that Python layer into my network. The same way you put a convolutional layer or a max pooling layer, you put this Python layer in there. Um, and, it, and it's treated just the same as all the native uh, uh, cafe layers. Um, so that's kind of what this is saying, essentially. Um, and you've got these four functions in, in the Python layers. You've got setup, reshape, forward, and backward. Uh, setup is generally just kind of a, um, generally just kind of an error checking type of function. Reshape, or, or whatever else you need. Sometimes it's, it's pre-processing stuff. Uh, reshape is whatever the, the output of that layer needs to be. Uh, versus what it was to begin with. Uh, you've also got your forward and backward. So essentially, forward takes those bottom um, bottoms into the, into the network, and uh, it 
spits them out as tops, doing whatever processing in between. Uh, backward does just the opposite. Uh, you're taking those tops, you're sending them backwards across the network. Um, and so for a loss layer, that would mean backwards would be propagating a, a, a gradient backwards. Um, but for a, a data layer, you can combine your own unique Python data layer. Uh, backward might just be a pass. You wouldn't do anything uh, because you're not going to you're not going to keep propagating past the data layer since that's the beginning. So you you can basically just define how that layer should behave with these four functions, uh, which is really really nice. So this is kind of a overview of a uh, Python layer. Uh, essentially, at the top, uh, you got your setup here, and this is kind of the, the syntax of Python if you're new to it. Um, it's very clean, very simple. Uh, indentations matter, by the way. Uh, you got setup where you're essentially maybe checking the size of your bottom um, uh, or, or size of other features, you're just pair checking here in this case. Um, you gotta reshape. Say this is a lot. Since this is my new loss layer, um, I want a scalar loss output, so one error value for the entire network. So I'm gonna reshape the the top part, the output, to a scalar value. Um, and you basically can define your four, which in this case would be the be like those mathematical functions that we saw for the loss. Uh, this would be where you put that is in your four function. Um, and then the backward is essentially your way updating um, your, your error gradients uh, that that get um, changed the weights of the network. So this is a kind of a rough shell of what a, a boss layer implemented in Python would look like a Python layer. Um, and as I said, you take this layer uh, the same as you would take any other layer, and you can put it into your proto proto text uh, file, or you'll import it essentially into that file. And uh, these these functions will be called essentially. So you'll have a forward pass, you'll reshape it, and then you'll have a backward pass after you've set up, of course. Yeah, so uh, I probably should change this. They call it Jupyter Netbook. I have a notebook now. Um, I don't really know exactly what this word is. Basically, uh, IPython or Jupyter Notebook. Um, you can execute like one line at a time, which is nice. So. Um, so you can, you know, have a print statement or something, see it come out, you know, and um, it's just kind of nice for for kind of slowly, methodically working your way through uh, the code, which is nice. Visualizing is really easy. Um, plotting with with all sorts of like pre pre printing essentially um, is all capable and capable of doing all that. So uh, not necessary, but this is a this is a good thing to try to use if you want to. Uh, so this is a data step. Uh, data preparation is uber important in machine learning. Um, you can have the best architecture in the world and the best loss function. Uh, if your data sucks, it's not going to give you good results. Um, that is, if your data set is not uh, large enough, if it's not representative enough of, of what you're trying to model, um, if you have not prepared it properly, that is taking steps like normalizing. Uh, normalization is, if you don't know, essentially just um, kind of creating a standard range for all your values. Um, so, for example, if you had like a really, you had some uh, data set where you got some number that's in the tens of thousands and then some number in the 0.001 range, uh, taking a Euclidean distance between those two values is going to give you totally uh, ridiculous data, essentially. So, your loss function is not going to work like it's supposed to. So, you need to normalize that. You know, 0.001 and that 10,000 um, into a, a defined range. Um, doesn't always matter what the range is, um, but but you'll that'll, that'll be something that your loss function will tell you. Um, so subtracting so the mean of the data set is something uh, that you should do. Uh, that's essentially the same thing, same concept, except you're normalizing images, uh, all of your data, kind of creating a baseline or a, a standard range uh, by subtracting the mean. And you'll see this, so you'll, you'll probably find a lot of code out there that's got these three steps um, in them, or at least these two steps where you've got the mean subtraction and then this transpose, as we already talked about, the channels are flip-flopped, um, so you're going to have to, uh, to swap those. Uh, so you'll see this a lot in uh, code that you'll, like the other code you'll find out there. Um, so you can do all this manually uh, through 
you know, your own functions or maybe MATLAB's got some stuff or whatever. Um, but you can also do it in your network, uh, at least to a certain extent. Um, you can uh, essentially just give your network what is the mean uh, of your images. It'll subtract it for you. Um, it can, it can uh, there's a technique in machine learning where essentially you flip the image and you take the, like, the negative image essentially uh, to, to supplement your data set. So if you don't have a lot of data, you basically create artificial data essentially by flopping it around and distorting it slightly. Um, you can do that in CAFE. Uh, the layers will, some of the layers will do that for you. Um, so uh, that's kind of two things just to consider. Um, and, uh, so, and then the last thing I mentioned here is again, make sure your training validation is separate, especially if you're doing working on like a public data set where it's very defined. Some of the data sets have training and validation and testing data uh, delineated very specifically. And if you're just throwing all that data in and messing it up, uh, you're not going to be able to compare your results to public benchmarks because you essentially um, you've like tainted your data. Uh, you can mix it all together. Your model now has learned all the wrong data and all this stuff. So, uh, so it's just keep that in mind. Uh, so now the training. Uh, mainly, what you need to know about training is this one file, file solver.prototex. Um, it's the only, it's the major other uh, protobuf file that that we work with. Um, it essentially is is all of your kind of important neural network uh, uh, parameters. So, um, in addition to pointing to your training validation data, uh, it'll you tell it how many iterations you want to want to train on. Um, uh, I think epochs are in there, which is basically number of uh, number number of iterations. Um, you've got your learning rate, your momentum, your step size. Some other function, some other parameters that you might not know. Uh, if you've taken a machine learning class or anything with neural networks, uh, you've probably learned a lot of the basic what are called hyperparameters. There are other ones in there that I had not heard of when I started, uh, so you might have to Google them and figure out what they are. And read the again, read the documentation. We'll tell you what all of these parameters are. Um, you basically have a snapshot, which is how you save your, your model. Um, if you point it to there. You say how often you want to you want to snapshot. Maybe it's every thousand iterations. Maybe it's every ten thousand iterations. Um, the snapshots are pretty large uh, because it creates two files. They're about a gigabyte a piece. Uh, so every time you save, you're saving a gigabyte worth of data um, to your network. So if you're if you're training for a hundred thousand iterations and you're saving every thousand, you just created a hundred gigabytes worth of, of saved data. So um, a lot of that's not necessary. So just kind of keep in mind how often you want to save. Uh, but again, if something happens and your network crashes and you know you were only saving every 50,000 iterations, you might have to kind of start over. So uh, validation frequency basically uh, you can say how often you want to run the validation network. So I've trained 10,000 iterations. All right, let's see how the network's performing now. Okay, well it's not good enough. Well let's train some more. Try it again. Uh, so all this is defined in your in your solver uh, file. Often just called a solver. Uh, so, if you look, at, if you read the, doc, the official documentation, they'll say things like this, where you uh, you have a cafe command, and you point it to the, the cafe tool, these tools, and you call train, and then you point it to where your solver is. Um, you can do that, and it'll dump all your data to your terminal. Um, I recommend, similar to the network, creating a Python file, which uh, again I've linked to the same guy. Uh, who's got a good example of one there? Instead of instead of just having one command where all of it, it obeys whatever is in the um, you know the solver file, you can create your own system where you say, all right, I want to run it this many iterations. I want to perform these functions in between, maybe to check the accuracy, maybe do like all these other intermediate steps, and then loop again. Okay, now I'm going to go through this loop, and so um, you can just define your own logic in your own file. Uh, which is useful for uh, for doing what you want it to do. Um, you'll see this a lot in the in the Python the Pi Cafe, as it's called, uh, solver dot step, and it'll be a number. This is a complete uh, uh, cycle. That is, you're you're performing four thousand uh, train steps on training, forecast, backward pass, and wait wait update. So that's a complete cycle. 
uh, as opposed to you could say solver dot forward, and all that would do is propagate one pass forward to the network. It would not back propagate or update weights. Um, similarly, you can say dot backward. So you can call these functions individually, but step will perform the entire loop. Um, so uh, why you would just call forward is in, in your inference stage. Inference mm -hmm. stage. That's when you're when you're testing your network. You might every time you check an image, every time you test an image, you need to call forward pass. Essentially, you take that image, you need to propagate it through the network. You can have an output, and then you can like see your output. To see a new image, you need to take that image, load it, pass it through the network again. So that's why you might call forward on its own. It's just to pass single images during testing. Uh, yeah, so the evaluation step, um, essentially it's done for you mostly. Uh, all that's handled, as I mentioned before, is val.prototext, just like the training is. Um, it's got your, your network architecture already saved in there. Um, it's already pointed at your, data, at your validation data, and so you basically say, um, uh, you basically just tell how often you want to validate, and it'll run that network on its own. Um, but as I mentioned, it's still a good idea to have your own checks write your own file, maybe you want to calculate um, the accuracy of all, all the classes all at once, maybe you want to calculate the accuracy of only a few classes, you can find that yourself um, with, if you write your own uh, like solve file. 